Jacobog by J.K. Rowling Read hastily in a feigned accent with little preparation by Michal Schick No copyright infringement is intended with this performance. To find the complete story, go to www.theichabog.com The Ichabog, Chapter 1, King Fred the Fearless Once upon a time, there was a tiny country called Cornucopia, which had been ruled for centuries by a long line of fair-haired kings. The king, at the time of which I write, was called King Fred the Fearless. He'd announced the fearless bit himself on the morning of his coronation, partly because it sounded nice with Fred, but also because he'd once managed to catch and kill a wasp all by himself, if you didn't count five footmen and the boot boy. King Fred the Fearless came to the throne on a huge wave of popularity. He had lovely yellow curls, fine sweeping moustaches, and looked magnificent in the tight breeches, velvet doublets, and ruffled shirts that rich men wore at the time. Fred was said to be generous, smiled and waved whenever anyone caught sight of him, and looked awfully handsome in the portraits that were distributed throughout the kingdom to be hung in town halls. The people of Cornucopia were most happy with their new king, and many thought he'd end up being even better at the job than his father, Richard the Righteous, whose teeth, though nobody had liked to mention it at the time, were rather crooked. Fred was secretly relieved to find out how easy it was to rule Cornucopia. In fact, the country seemed to run itself. Nearly everybody had lots of food, the merchants made pots of gold, and Fred's advisers took care of any little problems that arose. All that was left for Fred to do was beam at his subjects whenever he went out in his carriage and go hunting five times a week with his two best friends, Lord Spittleworth and Lord Flippoon. Spittleworth and Flippoon had large estates of their own in the country, but they found it much cheaper and more amusing to live at the palace with the king, eating his food, hunting his stags, and making sure that the king didn't get too fond of any of the beautiful ladies at court. They had no wish to see Fred married, because a queen might spoil all their fun. For a time, Fred had seemed to rather like Lady Islander, who was as dark and beautiful as Fred was fair and handsome. But Spittleworth had persuaded Fred that she was far too serious and bookish for the country to love her as queen. Fred didn't know that Lord Spittleworth had a grudge against Lady Islander. He'd once asked her to marry him, but she turned him down. Lord Spittleworth was very thin, cunning, and clever. His friend Flippoon was ruddy-faced and so enormous that it required six men to heave him onto his massive chestnut horse. Though not as clever as Spittleworth, Flippoon was still far sharper than the king. Both lords were expert at flattery and pretending to be astonished by how good Fred was at everything from riding to twiddlywinks. If Spittleworth had a particular talent, it was persuading the king to do things that suited Spittleworth, and if Flippoon had a gift, it was for convincing the king that nobody on earth was as loyal to the king as his two best friends. Fred thought Spittleworth and Flippoon were jolly good chaps. They urged him to hold fancy parties, elaborate picnics, and sumptuous banquets, because Cornucopia was famous far beyond its borders for its food. Each of its cities was known for a different kind, and each was the very best in the world. The capital of Cornucopia, Shoeville, lay in the south of the country, and was surrounded by acres of orchards, fields of shimmering golden wheat, and emerald green grass, on which pure white dairy cows grazed. The cream, flour, and fruit produced by the farmers here was then given to the exceptional bakers of Shoeville, who made pastries. Think, if you please, of the most delicious cake or biscuit you have ever tasted. Well, let me tell you, they'd have been downright ashamed to serve that in Shoeville. Unless a grown man's eyes filled with tears of pleasure as he bit into a Shoeville pastry, it was deemed a failure and never made again. The bakery windows of Shoeville were piled high with delicacies such as maidens' dreams, fairies' cradles, and most famous of all, hopes of heaven— which was so exquisitely, painfully delicious that they were saved for special occasions, 
and everybody cried for joy as they ate them. King Porfirio, of neighbouring Pluritania, had already sent King Fred a letter, offering him the choice of any of his daughter's hands in marriage in exchange for a lifetime supply of hopes of heaven. But Spittleworth had advised Fred to laugh in the Pluritanian ambassador's face. "'His daughters are nowhere near pretty enough to exchange for hopes of heaven, sire,' said Spittleworth. To the north of Shuville lay more green fields and clear, sparkling rivers, where jet-black cows and happy pink pigs were raised. These, in turn, served the twin cities of Kurzberg and Baronstown, which were separated from each other by an arching stone bridge of the main river of Cornucopia, the Fluma, where brightly coloured barges bore goods from one end of the kingdom to another. Kurzberg was famous for its cheeses, huge white wheels, dense orange cannonballs, big crumbly blue-veined barrels, and little baby cream cheeses smoother than velvet. Baronstown was celebrated for its smoked and honey-roasted hams, its sides of bacon, its spicy sausages, its melting beefsteaks, and its venison pies. The savoury fumes rising from the chimneys of the red-brick Baronstown stoves mingled with the odorous tang wafting from the doorways of the Kurzberg cheesemongers, and for forty miles all round it was impossible not to salivate breathing in the delicious air. A few hours north of Kurzberg and Baronstown you came upon acres of vineyards bearing grapes as large as eggs, each of them ripe and sweet and juicy. Journey onwards for the rest of the day, and you reach the granite city of Jeroboam, famous for its wines. They said of the Jeroboam air that you could get tipsy simply walking its streets. The best vintages changed hands for thousands upon thousands of gold coins, and the Jeroboam wine merchants were some of the richest men in the kingdom. But a little north of Jeroboam, a strange thing had happened— It was as though the magically rich land of Cornucopia had exhausted itself by producing the best grass, the best fruit and the best wheat in the world. Right at the northern tip came the place known as the Marshlands, and the only things that grew there were some tasteless rubbery mushrooms and thin dry grass, only good enough to feed a few mangy sheep. The marshlanders who tended the sheep didn't have the sleek, well-rounded, well-dressed appearance of the citizens of Jeroboam, Baronstown, Kurzberg or Shuville. They were gaunt and ragged. Their poorly nourished sheep never fetched very good prices, either in Cornucopia or abroad, so very few marshlanders ever got to taste the delights of Cornucopian wine, cheese, beef or pastries. The most common dish in the marshlands was a greasy mutton broth, made of those sheep who were too old to sell. The rest of Cornucopia found the marshlanders an odd bunch, surly, dirty and ill-tempered. They had rough voices, which the other Cornucopians imitated, making them sound like hoarse old sheep. Jokes were made about their manners and their simplicity. As far as the rest of Cornucopia was concerned, the only memorable thing that had ever come out of the marshlands was the legend of the Ichabog. Next time, Chapter 2, The Ichabog. Once again, no copyright infringement intended. Please don't sue me.